Hello and welcome back to Catholic in America. I'm Father Michael Nixon. And uh, so many times people, uh, one of the biggest struggles that people can have can be in family life and particularly in the most important of family relationships, that of marriage. And so it is a great joy to be joined today uh, by one of my uh, favorite speakers on the theology of the body, on marriage and family life, and uh, someone who lives it himself in his own marriage. And uh, my good friend, Damon Owens, is, is uh, live with us today. Welcome, Damon. Thank you, Father Michael. It's great to see you. It's been too long. Been too long, man. And, and uh, we're continuing our quarantine edition here of Catholic in America, um, yes. where we uh, we're, we're are almost completely uh, a rebuilt studio here in Panama City, Florida, coming to you uh, via Zoom, uh, Damon up in Pennsylvania. So tell me, uh, and for those that, that haven't uh, met you, heard you before, kind of your story of how um, just your, your faith journey, how you met the Lord and, and how uh, you and your wife both got involved in, in, in ministering to, to couples and helping strengthen marriages. Yeah, so I mentioned we're married uh, 27 years, April 93. And Mel and I really started in the ministry right after we were married. It was sort of an immediate uh, launch and trajectory. We had just had a major conversion back to the faith and I'm just going sort of in a backwards there. But we met in graduate school of all places, University of California, Berkeley. And I'm originally from New Jersey. She's from Los Angeles area. So we both kind of met up in Northern California. And when we met, had similar college experiences where, you know, although we came from strong Catholic families and active, you know, in the faith, uh, both of us had pretty much fallen away from our faith in college. Me much further than her. She still went to went to mass for you know for the mass's sake. I had I had given up what I thought was just uh, you know hypocrisy in that way. But I made just conscious decisions to to just to be just buck wild and mm -hmm. and and all the time not angry at God. I never denied God. I've, I've I respect people who deal with, you know, is there a God and does he exist? And does he, you know, I deal with that all the time, 27 years of ministry, but my struggles have always been, uh, Lord, I know you're there. I know you love me, but you probably don't like me right now. You mm. know, I, I probably broke enough of your rules that, you know, you're not real happy with me. And there's some good psychology, good family of origin stuff that, you know, we kind of project onto God, the father, you know, our natural father and the relationships that, um, that we have with him or with just others, the way we establish and attach. And as I've integrated that into the ministry, I, that's, that's basically my story, that uh, it was never a denial of God. It was never a sense that you know, there was some doctrine or something that, that moved on. It was, it's always been the, uh, the core of it, very relational, mm. but a very deformed view of myself that, you know, even though he's my father, he's God of all universe, he's all love, he's all truth, he's all knowledge, I get it, you are perfect. I'm not ready. You know, I've got to, I got to pull my bootstraps up for you to like me. That's been my defect. That's been my, my struggle. So when Melly and I met in graduate school, you know, we were, um, you know, sexually active. We were in the culture, you know, part of doing all the things that were there and had a major conversion uh, back to the faith of our childhood. And it was in and around this question and challenge of, of, of sexual morality. How do you wield this sexual power? And, you know, for the other things, part of that, I was, I'm, I'm still, you know, recovering engineer. You know, and that's, that's not just a job, Father Michael. That's a, that's a temperament. That's sort of a state of mind, you know? And I think even as a young engineer in school, I was like, How can you to take this apart work. and how can you put it back together, that's right? That's it. Yeah. That's it. We, you know, to ask the question, where does this go? What does this mean? Where does this fit in? That's part of the whole world as an engineer. So whether I'm building, you know, buildings, bombs, or theology, you know, it's the questions of what do things mean? And I, so that, that's honestly, that's really a thirst that's always been there. So I've, I was just, I wanted to know what things meant. I knew I had these desires. I knew I had these, these bad habits. I've had vices, sin, mm. but is it really about the balance of the check boxes? Does God really like me? And that's been the heart of it. And Melly and I came back to this faith when we started to hear language that we had never heard as kids before. We started to hear as Catholics as, you know, 22, 23, 24 years old, these teachings of, of uh, these biblical teachings, these ancient teachings of, uh, of our Christian faith that started to make more sense. Mm. I didn't, I didn't agree with all of them, but there was a cohesive, there was a connected truth about it. that was compelling. And I wanted to know how this thing worked. And the next step, of course, as you know, as a priest, it's not, it's not enough just to know what's good and true and beautiful. It's building the habits, the virtue to live it. So that's really where Melanie and I started to make changes in our relationship. And 
we made a, a powerful decision to, to stop having sex. We were dating maybe less than a year. We weren't even engaged to be married, but made a decision. And we came back to the church and um, God just blessed it. Hmm. Not in one fell swoop. It was sort of like this progression, you know, like the scripture story of the, he heals the sight and the guy says, people are walking like trees, you know, right. you, you do a little bit more. And kind then, of gradual. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but he was always in it. So, uh, you know, fast forward two and a half years, uh, we built this chase relationship, this new found love, and it was all wrapped up in this return to the faith, this return to Christ. So by the time we were engaged and married and married in 93, that launch into ministry was genuine. It was from the heart. It was like we were being cast in, you know, back into this church. And yeah, that pretty much has been the trajectory for the last 27 years. That's beautiful. Like maybe you can describe too, because I think this, this is something that so many people struggle with. Maybe that they believe in God. Sometimes they even, yeah, sure. Why not? I believe in the church. I believe, you know, but, but living it or seeing its importance, like what was that like for you to discover that our mm -hmm. faith, the faith that you grew up with, the Catholic faith, the Bible, Jesus was actually answering the questions that you were struggling with, was actually addressing those, those, those felt needs and wounds and hurts and desires that maybe you were looking somewhere else to, to, to satisfy. Yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that is the question. I want to affirm that because I think that's sort of a theme that, that runs from the beginning. And I would even go a little bit further and say that, that one of the big heart changes was, was even earlier. I tell the story often when I was uh, about 13, maybe 14, and preparing for that um, confirmation, really the receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit in the sac sacrament. And I was on a retreat I didn't want to be at. You know, I was a football, baseball, basketball, year-round athlete, you know, Boy Scouts, Eagle Scout, you know, all that stuff. To go on retreat was like, you know, I'm going to sit here for two days. You know how much I could do in these two days. You know, I didn't want to be there. But I had an encounter with Christ. Hmm. I met the Lord in a most powerful, unexpected, and in a way that was contrary to even the, the faith, not the faith tradition, but the spirituality of my parish, a very structured Irish Catholic parish. And I had this Jesus moment, this Holy Spirit moment that just, <laughs> it, 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 the Lord showed up, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it, at 13, you know, what do you do with that? You know, I tried to make it fit into the whole legalism. I tried to make it fit into the rules and the doctrine and the dogma. And it was, it was good enough. It was challenging enough at that age, but it sustained me really for five years up until college. Mm -hmm. But the break and the reason that I was so, I think, buck wild in college was because it's never enough. It's not enough to just be able to reconcile doing good and avoiding evil. There has to be that deeper relationship, that personal relationship with Christ that is not abstract. It's not outside. It's not just for one silo of my life but it should drive a unity of life. And this is what happens over those next few years. So I started to build this whole college persona, this whole, you know, college life. And it was girls and it was parties and it was being you know, popular and doing all the fun stuff and just having a blast. And again, never denying God, but keeping again a silo. Yeah. And I think what the difference was to answer your question was this was about sex. Hmm. Meaning what began as morality you can't ask moral questions without getting to that deeper question of well, who do you think you are as a man? Who, who are you as a boyfriend? Who are you as, you know, a guy? And then who are you as Damon? You know, who are you unique and unrepeatable, but then who are you as part of this, you know, half of humanity that God deliberately created in the first two stories of Genesis. So you got the stuff I, I call sometimes like the dry bones of the, in Ezekiel, mm -hmm. you know, the, all the, the bones are there. It's this, it's the worship, it's the scriptures, it's the stories you remember, it's the morality, it's the sacraments, it's the, you know, the stuff. But until those bones start to come to life, until so they start mm -hmm. dancing. And the reason they dance is because they're now connected to the things that really uh, uh, matter to you in your life. So there's the outside, and then there's this, this integration, this connection to the things that matter. And at 23, all I knew was I was in love with this girl. <laughs> this woman, this girl, Melanie, and I wanted to be a man that I knew I wasn't, but I knew I was supposed to be. And here's the kicker. I could see her, see that man in me when she looked at me and I wasn't that man. So it was like this, this agony, this ecstasy of being a fraud of like, she's going to find out. She's going to mm -hmm. find out that I'm, I'm selfish. I'm lazy. I'm tired. I'm, you know, I'm, I like my stuff and I'm, you know, and 
But then it's like, well, maybe I have time to get my act together. You know, maybe I have time to be the man that I want to be, that she wants me to be. I mean, that's a lot at 22, 23, at any age. Yeah. But God really showed up and and in and through her, there was this peace that came that um, on one hand, I'm I'm good enough, you know, as a person, as a man, as her as her boyfriend. Well, on the other hand, there is a clock ticking to become the man she deserves, the man that I, I want to be, the man that I know God wants me to be. So that was probably the, the thing that got the bones dancing. Yeah. All this stuff of my faith wasn't abstract. It really is the answer to understand how to live a life of, of wholeness and more importantly, a life of joy. And equipping you also to become who who Melanie saw you as um, in her amazing mercy and love and, and, and love for you, but more importantly, how God sees you too. I mean, becoming that man, um, that the one who God sees when he looks upon you and says, you're my beloved son, like all the sacraments and all, all the, 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 the novenas and prayers and, and everything else. That's the life of the church. It all becomes part of that, of, of that transforming your heart into, into the truth and that integration too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if it doesn't, it becomes this, that, that's the heavy yoke. That's right. the burden. That's when you get to be that bitter Christian, that, that one who's measuring morality with a, literally with a ruler or with a, you know, <laughs> a, you know, a measure of your own, because it, it, it's, it's so, you know, they call God and Jesus is like the hound of heaven, right? He's always there. He's always reaching out for us. And if we don't respond back, it becomes annoying and we either become very bitter or we, 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 um, you know, we, we bring God down to our level. And fortunately at that time I had Melanie again, and, and, and I say this, it sounds romantic and it sounds all, you know, cliche, but there was a dynamic in that love in that learning how to love that kept it from being an idea, a hobby, kept it from being sort of a thing I do on Sunday or Wednesday night. It was, it was, I'm seeing this woman and I want to love her. So I, I'm at it. I'm going to do this. I want this. And then seeing how, you know, how, how, much of a failure, how, you know, how weak and how much little power that I actually have, how little control and that constant yielding back to God, that surrendering back to God. And again, this is the, this is the 50 year old Damon talking about the 23 year old Damon. And right. <laughs> those were the experiences. Yeah. But then maturity gives us the ability to, to understand what they mean. Yeah. So. With that, like, cause I think for so many people, when you mentioned it, for your own journey, that sex becomes sort of like this thing that drives us away from the church yeah. and whatever our perceived notions and understanding of, of the church's thoughts on sex, that it's bad or dirty or all these things. So for you to come back into the full practice of your faith and for you and your wife both to jump into ministry and it be so united to understanding and, and, and diving into the gospel message about sex specifically, like what, what was that process like for you? Yeah, I think mean, that we was can a, ask Melanie what what it was like for her. But I, I, we, we've got right, you on the line, right. and then you put the two <laughs> stories together and you get close to the truth, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I honestly believe that um, the power was it, it, even when we're not living the full truth of our sexuality, either as a man or as a woman, or together in sexual morality and sexual union. Even when we're far from it, there's like this inner north pole. There's this inner movement towards something. We want it to be good. We want it to be fulfilling. We want it to affirm. We, there's an, even, even in the extremes of porn or in um, you know, prostitution or in, in abuse, we're always seeking this good. So for me, it was about finally getting a vocabulary. It sounds very objective. But be, to be able to know things by their names hmm. and then to be able to affirm the things that I was experiencing and the explanation actually made sense to me. And I'd say, you know what, that's, that's exactly how I felt in that moment. That's why that longing was there. That why that joy, that suffering was there. And we started to hear language. And this was years, maybe 10 years before I even heard the phrase theology of the body, which would take us to a whole nother level, mm. you know, with, a, with a, a more complete vocabulary. This was just looking at the law and saying, why would the church teach this? Why is sex for marriage? Why is, uh, you know, what do I do with these desires? What do I do with this desire to love and to be with this? Does that mean there's something in me that's bad? That somehow I've got, you know, a, a brokenness that, that I have this desire for her and for sex in general, but for her in particular. And then to put all that back into order, the law, simp- the law can't do it. The, the law will always look for a loophole. 
Mm-hmm. When we go by the, 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 the commandments, the law, there's a blind obedience and then there's a vibrant obedience. And, and, and a sort of vibrant obedience is one that doesn't demand to know and understand everything. But as we grow in the understanding, we start to live even the most difficult teachings for Christ, mm. for my beloved, for Melanie, for someone. It's always relational. And that was the pivot for me, that the difficult teachings in their objective form, first of all, hadn't been taught to me in their clarity. I just, I, I would like most people had an idea of what Christian sexual morality is, but was never really taught it in the context of, of my own growth. So when I heard that, that was an awakening. Like, oh, well, that makes sense. That makes sense. I don't know if I could do that, but that makes sense. Well, if that's the case, and therefore that I can see how those all fit together. Okay, that is, that's one thing. And that's, that builds trust, you know, with, with the church. It builds trust with an authority that says, you know, that makes sense. I don't know that I could live it. I don't know that's all of it, but that's not enough. It's not enough to just have an sort of intellectual ascent or sort of order in the mind and in reason. The faith element says, Doing it transforms me as a person. It changes the way I see myself, the way I now get glimpses of how God the Father sees me, you know, in a more clarity, how I can see other people in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that reason alone can't do. In other words, it's answering the questions of the everyday. So when it gets to that, then it stays on your mind. It stays a priority. It's more resistant to what Pope Benedict called the tyranny of the immediate, Right. Wow. Because because there's always a, something else to do to get our distraction. So sex has a particular way, if we have the courage, to, to stay with us and draw us to a deep understanding of identity, relationship with God and others, and with our mission, why we're here and what we're, we're truly going to do. Because it's the original blessing. You know, Genesis 1.27, God created sex. Let, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness, male and female, he created them and blessed them. He said, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion over the earth and subdue it. The whole story of Genesis 2, even after Adam's solitude was about the union of, of so something about our sex, our male, female, the drawing of the two together is an original primordial blessing. And you and I were taught this at the Theology Body Institute. This is part of, you know, what this, what this teaching enlightens but it enlightens a real human experience. So sex is a particular way with its power to draw together in a new way and when used wrongly to destroy in a uniquely evil way. And I think so many people have experienced the wounds of, of not living this correctly, either you know, through their parents, the, the brokenness in their own parents' relationships or abusiveness or, or infidelity, but then also in our own hearts. And I, I, don't, I don't need to go outside to other people, my parents, I can look to my own heart of how I, I haven't lived this or I've, I've grasped at it or lived in lust. And I think a lot of times we can kind of maybe get to a point where sure it's frustrating and sure there's sadness and it's never enough. And, and but this is who I am now, kind of, kind of like, you know, associating myself with my, with my wounds or my sin or, or my mistakes. So, so what was that, that journey like for you and kind of relearning how to love in your relationship with Melanie um, to back, back to that integration, back to seeing yourself um, as God sees you, not as, as, as your sin dictated. I mean, this is, this is who you are. Yeah. Oh, what a great question. I think um, I would, I would put it right at the experience so, so it wasn't an intellectual sort of light coming on that can do that. It didn't do that for me. It was this constant affirmation, you know, from Melanie. And it wasn't specific. It wasn't like she was saying, Damon, you're good. Damon, you can do it. It wasn't like the love has this balm, this balm, this power to balm without, you know, on the nose sort of obvious dealing with it. Just to know hmm. that I'm worthy to be loved for who I am. That's a, that's a balm. That's just, it heals, I would say, all wounds. To know that you're worthy to be loved for who you are, not what you do, but for who you are. And the simultaneous or the reciprocal of that is to know for certain that others are willing and capable of fulfilling your needs. And this is like sort of two axes of, of how we build attachment and relationships, to know that I'm worthy to be loved for who I am, not for what I do, and that others are willing and capable of fulfilling my need. And without naming it even, Love just constantly um, restores, repairs where that's been lied into over the years mm-hmm. to the point, as you said, 
where the lie becomes the narrative. It becomes the, I am a prostitute. I am a hoe. I am, you know, a sexually dynamic man, whatever it is. I am same. I'm homosexual. I'm gay. Uh, you know, name it. I am adulterer. But the lie of that is, is also revealing when we have the sort of a distance to say, this is so powerful that the real heart of it is our identity. Mm. It's our identity. And the false father, father of lies, is always trying to needle and slither in to give us that false identity that what we do is who we are. Oof. Right? But the true father, his voice is always the delighted dad who says, that's not who you are. Come back to me. Be become what you are. John Paul II would say to the family. He would say to us too, we, sin is so evil, it's so wrong because it's not who we are. That separation from God is, <laughs> it's so out of order. And the call is never, oh, look how bad you are. Oh, you'll never be loved now. That's the false father. And the work it, for me has always been to drown out that voice, to recognize the lie, even when it's sweet and soothing, and to hear the real father's voice who says, Damon, I am delighted in you. And just be who you are. And that is a power, more powerful call away from sin and the law than merely the law itself can do. Hmm. So I, I think it, that, you know, yeah. it's the power of, of sex that God gave from the beginning that is absolute, but it can be moved in either direction. <laughs> you know, seal with, the, with an abiding bond or divide in a destructive and um, an unchangeable way. The, um, well, if, you know, speaking that word of truth, maybe to a young couple that has been sexually active or a married couple that maybe hasn't been living the churches, the, the law, you know, as far as, you know, maybe they've been practicing contraception or something that's been unfaithful yeah. to their marriage vows. Like what, what would you want to say to them? I um, mean, obviously you do have so many of these conversations in your ministry to young couples and to not so young couples. What would be the word that, uh, that, that you would say to them um, yeah. about, is it worth it? And is it possible? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's actually two words and I don't mean literally two words, but there's two approaches where, um, and again, you know this in your priesthood, right? There's some homilies, there's some counters that you have where you know people are so comfortable in their mediocrity. They're so comfortable mm -hmm. in their sin and their weakness that uh, you need to afflict them. You, you, need to, you need to give them a harsh word to say, get up out of the mud. That is not where you live. So then there are some who are so afflicted and they're so down that they need that word of comfort and encouragement to say, that's not who you are help you. I think that dynamic is, is true. So the word is either to afflict the comfortable or to comfort the afflicted. So if I'm in front of this couple, I need to know, are, you, are, are, they, are they comfortable in, in where they are, sort of justifying and saying, we're doing the best we can, we're better than most. I'm not Mother Teresa, but I'm also I'm not Hitler. So God's going to grade on a curve. I'll be okay. You know? The goal is to be just a little bit better than Hitler, I think. That's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> just get in there. And, you know, if, if they're there, then my word is one of, of affliction. It's like you have a mission. God is counting on you for this. Are you really happy? How's this working out for you? You know, don't, don't give me the, the, the Twitter answer. How's this working out for you? Is there joy? Mm. Because of all the things you can try and fake, you can't fake joy. And for those who are really afflicted, I would not give them that strong word of, of you know, get your act right. I would give them the word of you are worthy to be loved. You know, you are, God is so delighted in you. And here's what's powerful is that both of those approaches speak truth. But the truth that's needed is a truth where people are and what they can receive. Mm. So they can only, it's only worth what the, the mode of reception is a, is a Thomistic, there's a law there. I can't recall rightly, but you know, all of uh, evangelism, all of teaching is, is metered by the mode of reception of the person. And we all need this at different stages of our life. We need comfort when we're afflicted. We don't need affliction when we're afflicted. Right. We, we don't need affliction when we're comfortable. I mean, we don't need a comfort when we're comfortable. We need affliction when we're comfortable. You know, we've got to know what the season is for each of all those. So that's a gift of evangelization. That's what we call pastoral ministry, not to withhold truth, but to know what truth is the one that needs to be in. So the couple, I would look them in the eye. I get to know them, I'd laugh with them, joke with them, get the guard, get their guards down. They don't have to, have to prove anything to me. They don't have to 
put on the mask of, you know, the good enough Christian, the good enough Catholic, and they could finally go, you know what? I haven't asked anybody this before. I can't believe I'm telling you this, but how do you, that is music to anyone in evangelism. Then it's like, you know what? I got, I hear you. I hear you. And then finding that true point of connection that says we're the same in this, in this um, relationship before the father, unique and unrepeatable, but delightful. So the answer is always, this is the short answer is always begin and begin again. Begin and begin again. again. I love that. And, and you brought up a couple times joy. And I think that that's, that's such a, um, maybe sometimes it's missing, you know, in the lives of Christians. I think what, something Pope Francis has reminded us of so powerfully, the joy of the gospel. Um, and, and your ministry outreach is even the names of them, joy to be and joyful ever after. Maybe talk about kind of the, the genesis of, of, of those and, and how, you, um, yeah, how, how you've seen the, the joy of the good news, challenging, challenging, convicting good news, theology, the body, the church's teachings, but how, how that's, that's manifested in the lives of the couples that you serve. Yeah, the, the first conscious sense of it really was back in uh, 2016 when I had just left as executive director of the Theology of the Body Institute and really tried to do some um, discernment, some authentic discernment about, you know, where have I been in these years? By then it had been, you know, I don't know, um, maybe 22 years, 23 years in ministry and not full time, but full time since 03. So I was just trying to figure out, Lord, what do you want from me? And part of that was sort of a recollection of where have you brought me? Where personally, where have I been? How have people received me? What has been the thing that really delighted me in ministry and as public speaking? And joy came right to, to my mind. Hmm. Um, and I actually, this is the truth, I when Joy T.O.B. first, the name for that, Joy to Be, was because I thought about what I wanted. It was aspirational. And I thought, you know, everything that I do has never been for academic. It's never been for you know, just debate for debate's sake or for see how much I learn. It's not, it's not a hobby. There's a joy that I want and a joy that I want others to have. Mm. And, and I never put words to that before. And the way God confirmed that was I was going through, like, I literally had like three, 400 talks that I never published, but I record everything just to hear, you know, and I, and I, and I hate my voice. So I never actually heard them. So I was going back to like a bunch of talks and all the talks that I picked out and, re- and listened to, joy was in it. I mean, literally, you know, I'd even have like the, the recorder on afterwards and people were like, oh, so there's so much joy in this. And th- thank you for your joy. Th- this is like during the discernment time. So, you know, when that happened, you're like, yeah. okay, Lord, okay, you're talking to me. And Joyful Ever After really is, is, is maintaining and actually growing that the ministry now because I truly believe that while there's controversy around love, you know, what is love? And we teach this uh, self gift, but you have to teach it. So it means there's controversy. There's no controversy around joy. When you say joy, people go, Oh yeah, I want that. Yeah. I want that. Yeah. I want some more of that. You can't have too much of joy. Right. You say love and people like, well, you know, what do you mean by love? Because I mean, you know, <laughs> they're, st- they're so distorted, but joy seems to be more pure in its ability to, to pass through the intellect and hit to the heart and to the will. Yeah. And that's what everybody wants. I know I do. And so that uh, I love the phrase, the evangelization by attraction, mm, you yes. know, that, that it's, it's, you're presenting something beautiful and that actually naturally attracts people to it. And I think joy is one of those things that's so rare nowadays. Obviously we've got kind of the, the facade, facade of joy or of satisfaction or, or, and a lot of that's been ripped away right now in the time of coronavirus and quarantine and, and, you yeah. know, all, all fear, death, you know, kind of staring us in the face as much as we try to, to run from it. Um, but in the face of all that, the authentic follower of Jesus, not, not because of us, but because of him, can and do experience joy. So I, I think that, that, mu- that must be really, uh, yeah, you, 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 get, you get to share that on a daily basis. It is. And I just give a scripture throughout the scriptures, but one of the scriptures that popped up from the beginning, it's one of our, our keys is John fifteen eleven, And if you read John 15 in the beginning, and even the, the, pr- the prior uh, chapters there, our Lord is being very specific here through John mm. about the law and commandments and being very clear about, you know, the immutable and the enduring and the reality of the commandments and law. But then in 1511, he says, I have told you all these things so that my joy might be yours and that your joy might be complete. Mm. So he wraps up even the affirming of the commandments and the law and the doctrine. He wraps it up like, look, 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 I want you to have the joy I have knowing that I'm the, the, 
begotten son of God, the father, that, that, that my joy that comes from that relationship is yours. Hmm. And that has really been the, the ethos, sort of the heart of, of all the ministry work that in the very least, you can't fake joy. You cannot fake joy. Even that mask you talk about, people try to, and you can see right through it. Right. You know, right. a good mood, an optimist, you know, I mean, I'm good weather, you know, the, but joy is when you're watching someone die, you're watching someone suffer, but there's a, there's a firmness to know that you're where you're supposed to be, that you're who you're supposed to be. It basically is exactly knowing that you're still the son of God, the father, mm-hmm. and then, however bad it feels, whatever the weather is, whatever the circumstances that come and go, there's something enduring about that union with God as father and joy is the fruit of that. It's not the cause of that. It's the fruit of that, which is why you can't fake it. Mm-hmm. And as a Christian, the joy comes in not always in dancing and even being happy, but there's a firm purpose of presence. And I just, I, it just delights me. I want that Father Michael so much. I want that more often. I want it for my children. I want it for Melanie. I want it for everybody we meet. So you can only get it from Christ. Amen. That's in great. Yeah. Well, I, I, I love that. I love that. Damon, I could talk to you all day, brother. Um, but uh, I just want to say thank you so much. Thanks for being on Catholic in America. Thanks for your ministry. And um, how can people find you in your ministry? And wh- who should be looking out for you and for your ministry? Yeah, I appreciate that. So Joyful Ever After really is a specific outreach to uh, married couples, a couple to couple call to live in communion. Mm. And joyfuleverafter.org is our website. And we actually have a big event coming up in June. Uh, we're hosting the Catholic Marriage Summit. Oh. Catholic Marriage Summit, uh, June 5th through the 7th, will be what we were shaping up to be the largest online marriage event uh, ever. I mean, you see a lot of these virtual conferences really blowing up. So if you go to joyfuleverafter.org, you can see our, a list of our speakers and topics. We want to be able to really uh, reach couples where they are now, not just in the shutdown, but even coming out of the shutdown. Uh, with a more zeal, with more, um, you know, desire to live their marriages in community than before. So joyful ever after.org. And we're, of course, we're all on social media with Facebook and uh, Instagram and all that good stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Damon, thank you so much and uh, blessings to you and to Melanie and to your kids. And thank you all so much for, for tuning in to this episode of Catholic in America. Thank you to our, those who've been sponsoring us on Patreon. Make sure you subscribe and uh, share, uh, share this content with other people and uh, share the good news of uh, the joy, the joy of what we have in Christ. So uh, from all of us here in Panama City, uh, God bless you. And have a great day.